So greetings, everyone. I'm David Reck, again, uh, founder and CEO of Scribe. Just to give you a little background, you can find all the information about Scribe on our website, which is scribenet.com. The other thing is that I will be sending a follow-up email to Karen and will provide the link for the recording of this, as well as some other links to both the Wellform Document Workflow as well as Scribe's main website, so that if you're not getting this immediately, it will be repeated to you in an email message that you can send along. Um, what Scribe, I'm not going to give you a whole long history of Scribe, but the quick thing to know is that Scribe started off as a research center at the University of Pennsylvania in conjunction with Princeton University. We were working on something called the Perseus Project, which was an attempt and is an ongoing attempt actually to capture in electronic format all of the classical materials from originally just from the ancient Mediterranean basin. Um, now it's ancient, late antique and early medieval history from Europe and the Mediterranean basin and extends even into parts of Asia. Um, and the basic idea of it was to develop a discipline that enabled numbers of humanities based researchers to use computer technology to do their research and to further their research. And so some of the assumptions that we made about this were things like anything we build has to be accessible to someone who's a lay person, not require, in the case of the original mission, not require, you know, technical and markup language expertise. In the case of our extended processes, not require publisher expertise. And that anything we did had to use common tool sets. So in the case of the well-formed document workflow and what we're demonstrating to you, today. Um, our system basically relies on Microsoft Word or text documents. And then if you're doing direct typesetting, we're using the most popular format of desktop publishing, the Adobe InDesign. And, and then the last thing is, uh, if you're familiar with the concept of granularity in XML, the basic idea is that you can start simple and add complexity and add elements to things. And our basic assumption is that not only works in an XML environment, but it's also the way we think about how publishing goes. And so what we're trying to accomplish is helping people who are what Scribe refers to as mission driven, that is people who have a professional organization, some kind of educational mission, um, some kind of other element that's outside of the the, in quotation marks, professional publishing arena, publish their materials. And to that extent, we've developed our well-formed document workflow to aid with that. Now, I'm going to introduce the well-formed document workflow, and I'm going to demonstrate it for you fairly um, through the whole process. But I basically want to just explain a couple of things to you. So our well-formed document workflow is named so because the underlying theory of XML, that is extensible markup language, is the notion that you need to have a well-formed document that's part of the technical requirements. And a well-formed document means that all of the elements within your publication need to be defined and that within your publication, any element that rep represents something needs to be encapsulated technically speaking in left and right angle brackets, but in a more general sense, just has to be defined as such. So that if you're working, for example, in a book, you would define the book. And then inside that book, you might have chapters. And inside those chapters, you may have paragraphs or call outs or epigraphs or block quotes or various lists or illustrations and things like that. And in our system, the basic idea is you have a name for all of those things. You demarcate each element based on that name. And then from there, you can move publications from one technology to another in an automated way. And the basic idea in our system is that authors would 
write their materials in Word. They would use a tool that we call the Scribe Add-in. I'll show that to you in a few minutes to do some basic formatting or use the Microsoft Word features to do basic format like lists and tables and things like that. That then the manuscript would be edited in Word either by you, an agent for your organization or by Scribe. Then they get processed through our, what we call Digital Hub, which is a cloud-based processing engine that you would have access to. And then from there, you can either go directly into XML, HTML5, an EPUB, or back into Word, or you can then take it through the typesetting process and design it, lay it out, create a PDF, and then do whatever editorial need you would have, any kind of proofreading, indexing, et cetera, and then process it out to one of these formats. And what you're missing from this diagram is that once you get it into our format, you can go through the whole process again and again so that if you're updating things or reissuing the same textbook, you can do that as well. So each of these points here with this cog represents the digital hub and interacting with the digital hub. And these other elements are basically just representations of document types. Any questions so far? So let me click out of here for a moment. Again, the basic idea is that you would have an author who submitted his or her textbook in Microsoft Word we would work with you to get it structured properly. From that structure, we could easily generate out a multiple sets of versions. We can also help you with the process of proofreading uh, as well as making alterations and indexing should you need. And that indexing can take place at multiple stages. It can either take place in the manuscript stage or in the page stage and be maintained throughout the process. <laughs> Everyone has that so far? Yeah. Okay. So um, this is our website. I'm going to just show you one quick thing. If you go into the Wellform document workflow, there is a drop down menu and a couple of things to know. Number one is um, everyone on the planet has access to the documentation for all of our tools and for all of the processes that we have. And so at any point, if you need help, you can, or you need more information even today, you can go to our documentation section and you can read our documentation. Um, it gives you information both about the tools and the functionality within our system, as well as general procedures that we have and quality control information. For the Open Textbook Network, before we start on our first projects in the beginning of the year, we're also going to add elements for better explanation from the whole publishing chain for textbook development. We're also going to help with policies for authors and handling authors and submission guidelines and a whole host of other things that will be available to you in this documentation section. Um, the other section to be aware of is what we call the download section. So Scribe's main technology, that is the digital hub, as well as tools that work within Word, are somewhat protected. That is, they're not fully open. Um, what we call our Scribe add-in, which is a full editorial and production tool, for Microsoft Word does not, people don't have access to, to that openly. That is open to you because you're a member of the Open Textbook Network, but there are some use restrictions on that, as well as access to the Digital Hub. Our processing engine is also limited and not open. That would be open to you as well as, as members of the Open Textbook Network, but again, limited. Um, what I'm showing you now are the things that are available openly. And I can also explain to you that 
with the exception of the processing speed of the digital hub and some of the editorial functionality of the scribe add-in full version everything that i'm about to explain you can replicate open if you so choose to do um, so if you go to the download section there is a smaller version of our SAI Lite, which is available to anyone. And we use that both as an authoring tool, as well as a, an open editorial tool. Last count, we had almost a thousand people who were not subscribers to the Wellform document workflow, utilizing the SAI Lite for their own workflows and helping them in their own workflows without them needing to engage scribe um, <clears throat> the other thing we have are copies of our <coughs> excuse me xml dtd so that if you want to check that out and see that it's going to function within your environment that is available to you as well as templates for microsoft word and cascading style sheets for ebooks if you so desire if you are a member of the OTN, you actually would have an account, and I'm going to sign in right now as you would. So I am signing in as using my email, and I use my password, which you would maintain. Whoops, there we go. I don't know why that just happened. And when that happens and I go to the download section, there's a much larger group of files that are available to us including a full package of tools and the scribe add-in that i was describing to you before all of our tools work exactly the same way basically you hit the download button here it drops a zip file down on your download arena for me that means my desktop you extract it and once you do that there's always a setup file in the tool set you double click on the setup file. You agree to the terms of use if it's the full SAI. If it's the SAI Lite, there are no terms of, of use. You hit OK. It acknowledges your registration through our website. And then it is available anytime you open up Microsoft Word as a feature in Word, either as a ribbon in the uh, Microsoft environment or as a panel in the Mac environment. The other thing that you have available to you when you are a subscriber to the Digital Hub, that is someone who's a member of the OTN or um, our other clients is to the Digital Hub. And I'm going to demonstrate this a little bit more carefully, but basically the digital hub is the environment where files are processed from one format to another. So for example, you can take a Microsoft Word file and turn it instantly into an EPUB 3 file that's fully accessible, or you can take that Microsoft Word file, turn it into HTML5, or you can turn it into a file that is ready for InDesign tag text. So I'm going to leave this environment really quickly. Um, our essential tool, that we, the essential way that we work, and I'm going to just show you this in a little bit more detailed format, I assume everyone can see this, is that essentially the typical way we work when we're working full service, that is if Scribe is providing all of the editorial and production services and giving you the final product. Our general way of working is illustrated here. Each of you will have a slightly different working methodology and you'll have slightly different submission methodology, but the basic will be structured using either our SAI Lite or the full SAI in Microsoft Word. From there, copy editing will take place. Our normal allowance is that when you're finished with copy editing, you would confer with the author, make sure that your copy edits 
that you are making are acceptable to that author, as well as having the author address any questions that you may have or missing parts or inconsistencies, et cetera. That once that's done, it would come back, turned into what we call a final Word file, processed through our digital hub. Typically, what we will do at that point is generate a typeset file using InDesign. Once that typeset file is done, what we would do is then have the author review that file once again to find any kind of egregious errors or make any last minute changes, though we encourage them to make very few changes at that point. Once that happens, we have a set of tools that works in InDesign that overcomes many of the technical limitations of InDesign with respect to XML and other markup languages. From there, we put it back in the hub and our hub can output either directly EPUB2, EPUB3, Mobi, HTML5. It can also output our scribe markup language or a word file for what we call round tripping. There is also a separate branch of the digital hub that we call our developer branch that is a command line environment that allows for the creation of a kind of generic TEI um, JATS format, and which is also formerly called NLM, and a couple other of the common XML formats. So basic process is copy edit in Word. If you're doing typesetting, typeset that in InDesign. If not, go directly into some kind of electronic format or some kind of marked up format. If you're typesetting in InDesign, you would use that as a last minute opportunity to do proofreading and, and interact with your author for alterations, finalize that file, and then process that back into our XML file. Uh, David, uh, can I uh, ask, uh, it looks like uh, G. Corin has asked, uh, where do you think peer review fits into this process? Ah, so um, what we like to do for peer review, and thank you for asking that because I forgot to mention that, um, what we like to do for peer review is at this point here where it says structure documents with HTML styles and then place the image callouts and everything, what we like to do for peer review is we like to set send out one of three file types for pre peer review. Um, we either like to send out a Microsoft Word file, which we do what we call lock and ask reviewers to comment directly within the file. Um, and generally speaking, when we handle review, we have a series of questions that we also like the reviewers to ask or answer, excuse me, and that would accompany that file, or we would generate out an EPUB more frequently. We are sending out, um, right now we're sending out more frequently, we're sending out EPUB files for review and asking people to either comment within there or just give their comments outside of that, or generate a PDF file for review. And we normally do it there because once the file is structured, you can easily output a file that you could send to reviewers that would be easy for them to interact with. Did that answer your question? David, I'd like to actually add sort of another um, layer to your answer. And that is, this is a great example of something that Scribe can manage for you, an ad hoc service, or it's something that we can do through, you know, um, the Rebus community, if we were to figure that out in our peer working group or a system that you may have more locally, it doesn't have to go through, you know, just sort of one scenario. There are options here for how we could manage peer review. Um, I would also like to, David, just talk a little bit about InDesign, um, when someone would use it, kind of the, how extensive or not extensive as the case may be, that InDesign piece is. And if you want to mention um, anything about the PDF generator. Okay, so um, yes, thanks, Karen, for asking that. So um, I was ac I was actually going to do that when I did InDesign, but since you asked that right now, I'm going to address your question. Um, so it, 
in order to get very, very good typographic standards and to have very good output, the unfortunate situation in this world right now is that for things like textbooks, which tend to have a lot of elements in them, the only really good solution is to use InDesign to do typesetting. Um, there are some systems like Pressbooks and a couple of others that are emerging that will automatically generate out PDF. The problem is that they are templated and constrictive. So what happens is, is that for textbooks, it makes it difficult to work with. If you're familiar also, those of you who may be familiar with the University of Minnesota, they have a automatic PDF generator out of their system. The unfortunate thing there is that things like tables and images are very difficult to manage. Um, and so if you are allowing at the moment, if you are allowing elements like multiple lists and multiple tables and images and and sidebars and all kinds of other things that are typical in university textbooks, then the InDesign program is mostly required to accomplish that. Um, and the problem, of course, with InDesign is a twofold problem. One of them is it requires expertise to properly typeset within InDesign. And the second thing is that it does not produce a good archival distributable format. That is, you can produce various markups out of it, but it does so in an incredibly inconsistent and poor way and will reorganize your content in ways that break up the flow and make it unusable. So Scribe has been doing several things for that. Number one is what we do is we will help you if you want to typeset it yourself or you have that expertise in your environment to set up templates that are customizable or can be easily deployed for various elements. The second thing is, of course, we offer the service of typesetting. And if you're using the well-formed document workflow, that is fairly inexpensive because um, it's the flow can be automated. Or the third thing that we're doing is for less sophisticated publications, we're working on and should deploy first quarter of next year, a fairly robust PDF generator. Um, in our tests right now, it is able to do an academic monograph with tables and lists and figures and footnotes um, very well. Hopefully, um, we'll get some of the kinks out. If you're doing textbooks at the moment, uh, the one limitation that we have right now is it doesn't seem to handle marginalia very well. So often people will put definitions or further reading or further information into the margins. And at the moment, it's not doing that um, in what we consider to be a typographically acceptable way. So at the moment, if you're doing complex typesets, InDesign is a needed requirement. Um, otherwise, in the next year or so, we should be unrolling a number of very robust PDF generators, and that will be preceded first quarter of next year by what we're calling a monograph and semi-textbook producer. That is, if everything is vertically down a page, except for images, which you can wrap with paragraphs, then it will work. I hope that answered that question sufficiently. So just to give you a very rapid demonstration, again, what will happen in our system is that very rapidly, the basic idea is, is that using a tool that we've developed, somebody would apply basic markup, I should actually show you that tool. And then what they would do from there is use our digital hub to process files. And then from there, um, you can essentially output any format that you might need. 
And my assumption is that at the moment, the predominant format would be PDF and EPUB or some kind of HTML. But we also know that in the library world, there are plenty of other formats that are used um, predominantly to EI. My Word file seems to have gotten up. Oh, now it's working. Okay, seem to have gotten stuck. So if um, if you look right now at my Word file, what I'm showing you is what's called the scribe add-in light. And this is a tool that we use without training. We just document this for authors and for some of our editors to use. What it has is a number of features where basically if they're working, they would enter in materials And if they're doing a list, whoops, let me. Basically, all they would do is use the, the um, general components there. And then essentially what happens is, is that we've created a style gallery so that essentially what they would do is they would just merely say this chapter number, click there, and it would format it for them. If it's chapter title, you would click there and format it for them. In reality, they wouldn't need to worry about a list or a paragraph, but if they wanted to work with a paragraph, they could just hit paragraph and it would automatically generate that. And that's as difficult as the tool is. This um, only covers a handful of things. And even for our textbook templates, it really has a very small list of things that we ask the authors to do because we know that we're not going to get full compliance from them. And what we're looking for is somewhere in the 80% or better. That is a grade of B or better. And if they can do that, they can easily help us with about 90% of the work because our digital hub will do the rest. Um, when the materials come to us, generally speaking, let me just get rid of this. Generally speaking, what we would do is we would use our tools to do some basic formatting. And I'm just going to show you this really quickly. Um, this is an example of what we are typically get from our authors. And instead of using the scribe add-in light, you would have access to what's called the scribe add-in. And that scribe add-in offers a number of features. It offers the same style gallery that you saw before, except that these are customizable so that anybody can generate specific ones for their needs or they can use from a, a library of galleries that we've created. The other thing that it does in addition to help with the nomenclature and application of structure is it has a series of editorial tools that help with common problems in manuscripts that enable you to automatically clean up things in manuscripts, or it has a series of tools that help with developing editorial style sheets, as well as managing small things like title case. There's actually a feature called Americanization that will take a British version of something and turn it into an American version, though I doubt we would need that. Um, and it also has a robust series of find and replace and lastly, it has what's called a final QA, which will check a document to make sure that you've done things in a what we call valid method. It doesn't correct your errors, but it will check to make sure that you did things according to our working methodology. Now, we would train you, of course, in all of this and make the training videos available to everyone. So basically, both the nomenclature that we, for example, call this a chapter number or, or chapter number or CN in our world, or this is chapter title or CT in our world, or this is an epigraph or EP in our world, um, and this is an A head or AH in our world, we would teach you not only that basic nomenclature and how to access the larger materials, but we would also teach you how to use our tools and how to teach others 
how to use our tools. And again, it would be fully documented. And again, it would be fully um, recorded and you would have access to the videos. So basically what happens in our system, and I am going to do this very quickly, is that once this is all done, you would copy edit, peer review, get a document done, and it would look kind of like this. Basically, what it would have is chapter numbers, chapter titles, things like that, access marked out in our system. Um, our system would add that this is a paragraph first, but it would handle all the normal paragraphs. It handles multiple languages, anything that can be done in Unicode, so any language can be handled, um, including Russian, Chinese, or small pieces of Chinese anyway. Um, it will handle tables and lists, et cetera. Once you have that solidified and the manuscript is ready to go, at that point, what you would do is you would interact with our digital hub. And essentially, what you would do is you would go in and you would start Oh, let me click out of here. I had already signed in, so let me go back here. There we go. You would start a new project. Um, every project has a code. And so you would click there and it walks you through it. If you had any kind of metadata or anything else in this case, for example, I can put in the title OTN demo. Um, there's a number of codes for BISEC. I'm going to skip this. Um, and it also allows you to add ISBNs. If you have, you can add information about the creator, any kind of contributors. There's also what's called extended metadata. If you're managing a bunch of the metadata that is needed for libraries, you can click here and extend that metadata. Once you're done with that, um, it will only go to the required areas. So I have to put a creator. In this case, I'll give it David Reck. And I am now done. Once I'm done with that, I can upload my file by going here. And what I will do at this point is all I do is take the file drag it here, it does not like Zoom, so my apologies. There's, there's the file. And then the other thing I'm going to do just really quickly is I'm going to put some images in here because I did create call outs for those images. So I'm going to drop those images in here. Now, when you're doing printing, um, you need a higher quality image size than for EPUBs. So our system will automatically manage your images and properly convert them. With one exception, you have to tell it which image is the cover image when you include that. And basically what you do is you would upload that file. And once you upload that file, you can essentially turn it into any of those formats that I mentioned to you. So it knows you have a Microsoft Word file as your upload, and you can either turn it into an EPUB file, which would enable you to generate that EPUB, or as I mentioned to you before, you can turn it into an InDesign file. While it's doing that, just to get quickly through this, I'm going to go into this blank template that I've set up. This is uh, set up like a simple monograph file and it also has fonts loaded in here that I didn't load um, only because I'm in a rush. It's an empty file and so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to download the EPUB file just to show that to you and as I download that I'm also going to create an InDesign ready file I've glossed over the fact that there are a number of settings that you can use in our system that allows you to do custom output and to prepare things so that you can 
um, meet the needs of that specific textbook. Various textbooks have requirements for different kinds of notes, or if you have glossaries, you can either put the glossaries at the end of the book or put them in line or have them be mouse overs in your ebooks, all kinds of um, elements that you can customize the settings for. But our basic ebook gets built and it will automatically just handle whatever you put into the hub in terms of the digital hub. It will handle images, it will handle tables, and it does a, a very good job at this because we've developed the algorithm to figure that out. Um, as I mentioned to you before, it also will generate out an InDesign tag text file for you to automatically flow into InDesign. And so what would happen here is generally speaking, once that's done, you would go and you would place that file. Whoops, that is not the file I meant to open. My apologies. I'm going to cancel that. I'm going to have to, I've messed that up. I have to uh, do this really quickly. My apologies for that. I grabbed the wrong file. Once you do that in InDesign, it is unhappy about that. You can hit cancel or do a whole bunch of things, but until you clear that out, let's do that again. I'm going to place that file. And this time I'm going to grab the correct file, which is this one. And what happens here is that you basically, after we train you, you would have the expertise to know how to use these templates as well as to do what's called auto flow. So the typography here, because of the way we set up the files and because of our expertise in developing the well-formed document workflow, basically automatically lays out. Um, sometimes you need to make a few adjustments more typical of what happens is that this is an opportunity for the authors to do review. And so what we would do here, for example, is maybe change this um, to, you know, the empire of the OTN, open textbooks are the future, something like that. Um, and at that point, you make any of your alterations. And what we have is we've developed a set of tools in InDesign that will enable you to export that out and do that in a quick automated method. And so what we've done is we've developed a series of tools that allow you to export. I'm going to just run them all. I'm not going to go through these. But basically what it does is it turns it into a very nice flowable XML file that can then be deployed in our digital hub into other versions. And so basically what happens is our set of tools goes through. It just told you that you can't undo what I just did if you're using the editorial features in InDesign because it basically is taking the file apart and will enable you to then move it to various other formats. At this point, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to export this. I'm going to export it as XML onto my desktop. I hit export. And then once again, basically all I have to do is go and upload another file, which is that corrected file. I take that, I put that up here. delayed. I don't know why we're delayed. Let's try that one more time. There we go. Now let's try that. I upload that file. It now reads it. It knows that that's the most recent file. So now I can output, for example, HTML. 
I can convert that into an HTML file. If I have my images available, which I'm going to now take and put on my desktop just to show you this, I could download this file, double click on it, and it would instantly be available. This, of course, doesn't have a style sheet affixed to it, but it would instantly be available to you via the web, or you could turn that same file into an EPUB 3 and have a fully accessible EPUB file. And then, of course, you can generate a PDF out of the InDesign file. That is the very rapid overview of the well-formed document workflow. And again, you would all be experts in this because we would train you, number one. Number two is it's fully documented and all of the training videos would be available to you in, in the same fashion that this demonstration will be available to you. And that is it. I don't know if anyone has any other questions or has um, other things they'd like to see demoed. David, Corinne has a question about, um, can more than one person access a project? Yes, so um, anyone who is within your organization can access any of your projects at any point. Um, you can only, the one thing is our system is not a content management system, so it doesn't know that you've checked something out, but everyone in your organization would have access to it. And one thing I didn't show you is that each of you would have uh, user access and management control. So you can add users and you can um, control their roles in your environment. And so we have three kinds of, of, of roles for you. We have an administrative role, which allows your people to add new users and to assign them roles and also access any project and manipulate any of those projects. We have a hub user role, which essentially allows them to access any project within your organization as well as manipulate it. And then we have what we call a freelancer role, which limits the role of the person to that specific product project and also limits some of the things that they can do there so that they can only do essentially their job. Um, and of course, anyone at Scribe has full access to everyone's projects in case you need assistance or anything, we can jump right in and help you. Other questions? I'm still curious about the DT. I'd like to hear what he's saying. But I know you already heard it. I'm unmuted. Oh. Hi. I'm, I'm sorry. Hi. I didn't this, hear you. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering about uh, XML DTDs. I was wondering if uh, there's some way that users can choose their DTD. Like uh, if I wanted to export to bits, could I upload a DTD and then export to that? Or, or am I? kind of limited to what Scribe already does. So, um, so the, the, here's the issue. Um, in, as an example, bits or jats, um, or you know, what used to be called NLM, um, those, uh, those XML schema um, do not map well for print and for print representation. And so what we developed our system around was essentially one way to those DTD. Mm -hmm. And so the answer to your question is, in this publishing chain, there's, you can't work within those XML formats. You basically work within our nomenclature. We convert it into scribe markup language. And then from there, we've mapped those to those various DTDs. Does that make sense? Sure. And, and the biggest problem is, um, I, I didn't get into this, but when you're doing print, in order to convey the structure of a document, there are a number of typographical practices that people engage in. For example, you always have spacing above, what's called leading above uh, groups of paragraphs, for example, that might be an extract you'll change the indentation of, of a, that extract or block quote. If you have a list, you'll have letting above and below those lists. We call that print articulation. 
And in our system, we automatically apply that. And the reason for that is so that a student who's used to encountering a book in a particular way gets that structure conveyed to them through the typographical um, display. And so our rationale is essentially in order to accomplish that, we had to have an XML that facilitated that. Now, scribe markup language actually, um, just to get a little technical for you, scribe markup language actually has three iterations. We have what we call our SAM, which is scribe abbreviated markup. And the SAM is the essential components that people need to delimit in order for our system to work. Um, the second version we have is SCML, and in parentheses, we call it SCML for print, which articulates both all of those elements and gives you an appended logical version. So the, a paragraph that comes first is called an F for first, and a last would be an L for last, and that allows us to control that spacing. And then finally, we have a pure SCML, which is a much more pure XML, which accomplishes that print articulation by properly nesting things so that lists within lists become just nested lists. And that is the one that we've mapped to all of the other DTD. I know right. I got a little technical, sorry for the long-winded answer, but that's, that's the answer to that question. I really appreciate it. That, that totally made sense to me. Thanks for spending your so, time on it. Um, hold on, let me get back to the chat. I don't know that anyone else had, I actually have did a, anyone else ask any question? I have a question. Can you comment on how output files would, uh, how others have used these to do a print on demand or to generate a print version? I know that you have the, um, the cover as a graphic as a single page instead of a um, cover spine and back. Um, would you, if you were desiring to offer a print on demand option, would you ex just export the InDesign version and feed that into whatever other vendor you're working with? Or how have other people done this? Yeah, I glossed over the cover creation, but you, you just anticipated the answer. So what I showed you that that little graphic that I showed you was a JPEG representation of a cover that we had designed in InDesign. Mm -hmm. So when we build covers, what we do, and, and um, especially for this, we would create uh, basic templates. The, the template doesn't have a design on it. It basically just has the measurements and structure and things like that. And yeah. what, what would happen is, is that the cover would be designed in InDesign in order to do print on demand for covers, you need a PDF version of the cover as well as a PDF version of the interior. Mm -hmm. And essentially what would happen is, is that we would set up that mechanic. In fact, we have a number of them um, set up already. There's a mechanic that is set up for you. And then what changes is the width of the spine whenever you print. Um, you need to know what that spine width is based on the page count and the type of paper that you're using for your POD uh, service. Right. Right. And so what would happen there is, is that you'd lay it out. You'd actually use a TIFF, not a JPEG for the cover image or a very high res JPEG. Um, JPEGs have a lot of loss because of the compression. We don't mm. love them. Um, and then you would essentially create a PDF from that and from that PDF is how we gain that JPEG that we use to represent in the ebook. Okay. Okay. And then the POD always needs PDF. So uh, um, up until March 2018, we we would absolutely require InDesign for both cover and interior. And then after that, it depends on whether we can use our PDF generator to do that for 